What's going on, y'all? Today's guest is Corey. Corey is one of the co-founders of the Brand Man Network, as well as Contraband Agency. He's an expert in digital marketing, focusing on platforms such as YouTube, Spotify, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, and also in influencer marketing. Corey and his team have gotten hundreds of thousands and millions of views and streams for artists of real listeners, real people that they can now engage with and grow their business. So this was such a fun conversation. In this episode, we talk about digital marketing, Corey's story, promoting shows, and so much more. To learn more about the things that we talk about in this episode, please check out the show notes at makingitwithchrisg.com forward slash podcast forward slash 104 for episode number 104. Or just look down here in the YouTube description and we have a link for, for that and many other goodies uh, right in there of things that we mentioned in this episode. I hope you enjoy this conversation with the amazing Corey. Live the life you love. Right before we uh, hit record, we were talking about uh, putting on shows. So you guys put on shows in Atlanta and mm -hmm. you're talking about doing warehouse shows. I'm really fascinated right now with this concept of like alternative venues um, versus like, right. traditional clubs. Uh, I've talked to people that are doing like hip hop shows in backyards in, um, in Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, I've seen these warehouse shows now. What, what kind of shows do you, do you guys do? Yeah, so I was like, we're starting to get into more of the like official, you know, industry official established venues in Atlanta. But our the biggest event that I've been a part of is, is a festival we built in Atlanta called Blue Summer. And that started actually, um, it started out with the concept of being like a festival and kind of like a house party type of thing. Mm -hmm. Just because the, venue, the place that we were looking at for at the time for it was like a house. Um, but we actually ended up doing the very first one at the back of like a tattoo shop. I, I had this okay. friend who like who worked at a tattoo shop uh, and they had a back event space that maybe fit about 120 people or so. And this was the first one. So we weren't expecting more than like 50, 80 people, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And just like the feedback we got from that and just like people being able to experience something like that in that environment was great. People were saying like, yo, this is dope. This is the back of a tattoo shop. I've never seen that. So we were wanting to kind of extend that that same concept to it but also you know be able to get into a venue that fit more of what we were looking for because we were trying to take this seriously you know, we're trying to grow it out it's like a festival festival um so mm -hmm. we end up landing on this venue in atlanta called the bakery which it okay. used to be it used to be an old bakery and they converted mm -hmm. it into a venue so like an art and venue space kind of like an art collab and then mm -hmm. they had like different performance rooms and stuff so we kind of just took the concept of like, yo, let's take this space that's already kind of like eclectic. It's already kind of like got its own energy and really weird. If you see the space, if you've ever been there, it's a very like weird artsy place, you know, but mm -hmm. it's it's eclectic enough that everyone feels comfortable there, in my opinion. You know what I'm saying? At least for the type of shows we do, because we mainly do like rap, kind of like mixed genre shows. Um, So the biggest thing I've kind of seen with it between doing like, let's say uh, the bakery, which is mm -hmm. very untraditional as far as venue spaces, and then doing something like Smith's Old Bar, which is like a very historic right. Atlanta venue. You know, so we've done stuff there. And it's like Smith's Old Bar, it felt more professional because it was built for the type of space, but sure. the bakery shows were more interesting. You know what I'm saying? It fit more with the vibe, the lay even the layout of it just fit better with a lot of the ideas that we have for the entire event. We try to make our event uh, very immersive. So mm -hmm. our big thing is, we want something going on all the time. So the way we're kind of directing the flow of attention, right? So right. Our, our big three things are music, film, and uh, music, film, and art are That's our awesome. big three. I love that. So we will start the event out with, we have a common area space where there's vendors and there's like visual artists kind of showing up their art. Um, we're transitioning to, there was a second room. Actually, let me back up. The bakery has like three different rooms. So we will get the okay. entire venue in. The first room has the vendors, the art people. The second room has uh, the short film screening. So we get a couple of uh, visual artists from the scene or just that we are uh, familiar with through artists and stuff that we know. They come on and show off five or 10 minute films. They kind of do their thing, show it off. And then the people who were just in the uh, other area are now transitioning to the film area. Once the film, we try to time the film thing to end right as the music performances are getting ready to start, like right as the actual concert is starting. So like, that's cool. That's that's worked out for us because when we're directing the flow of traffic, we're making sure people don't get bored and leave. Because especially mm -hmm. at these smaller shows, you know, like that's kind of the the problem you run into is people going like, oh, it's going to start at nine. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I've been here since seven o'clock because I wanted to get here early, but now I'm bored, you know. Like, um, right. So we figured out like, if that's something for people to do all the time and they're in an interesting space, it's not just your typical vinyl or those type of venues, um, which we like to work with, but just for like the vibe of our event, you know what I'm saying? It just, it fits together really well. And I actually think that at least from, at least from, I, I try to convert it into like my marketing brain and kind of apply it to what artists can do. And I'm thinking like, man, if we're seeing that people are willing to come to literally an old bakery and watch a concert, you know, that opens up the world of what artists okay. touring can look like. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. In my opinion. Yeah. Absolutely. I, mean, I feel like, because like now instead of trying to get in contact with all of the venues that are, you know what I'm saying, booked out with like Live Nation acts or booked yeah. out with these bigger <laughs> acts that beat them to it, you can just go book like an art gallery or a book like, you know what I'm saying, like an Airbnb if they let you. Yeah, or book. absolutely. Like, and I, we've been to outside concerts, you know what I'm saying? Like, I was, like we were talking about uh, before we hopped on camera, that's been one of the cool things about Atlanta is that so many people have been active that you see so many different types about this. Like, I've seen outside concerts, concerts, mm -hmm. like, in, in the woods, concerts in warehouses, awesome. concerts in, like, clothing stores, like, all type of stuff, man. It's like, man, I think that, you know, we're seeing it because we're in the event space. We're, right. we're thinking, putting events together. But I think that, like, artists start to realize that it's like, I think that's, like I said, it's going to change the way Touring happens is going to make it, I think, a lot easier for the average mm -hmm. artist to tour. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, or the, at least the artist who has either a savvy enough team or they mm -hmm. themselves have, like, the work ethic to do it to string along those types of events, you know? Yeah, it also saves a lot of time, right? Because I have definitely, yeah. when artists I've worked with, I've definitely spent hours and hours in the past just trying to get an email response from a venue and it's yeah. so frustrating when you're spending so much time that could be spent better and yeah. i love seeing these creative ways that people are doing shows now like like you said in warehouses and bakery shops and uh clothing stores and art galleries um i feel like if you one become creative like that and it can help you book a tour faster but also yeah. i have this thing called the 50 percent rule um so you should never play a venue unless you can fill at least 50% of its capacity, right? Um, right? So if you play in a 200 person club, you should be able to sell at least 100 tickets because that's how you're going to build a better relationship with the venue and get a response in the future. Because if you're only selling 20 tickets, they're like, man, this art is a waste of time. I'm not going to work with them again. Um, so, so I love this idea of like playing all these different alternative types of venues. So that's a great way you can build a tour and also like a great introduction for the first time in a new market, right? If you've never been to Atlanta before uh, and you play like a clothing store and it's packed um, now, you, now and you probably build a deeper connection with these fans. Uh, and yeah, they're going to come to a yeah. club show next time, next time around. I love that. Yeah. And it looks better. It makes for more interesting content. Like you said, um, you, you don't really deal with that problem as much of like overthinking. <laughs> I mean, yeah. people you, you thought you were going to bring out and yeah, man, like I, I, I think I've seen Airbnb, I think kind of push that forward by allowing like events and event spaces and things to rent yeah. through it. Mm -hmm. um, out here, there's a lot, there are a lot of event space companies that you can like reach out to and they'll hook you mm -hmm. up with, you know, like mm -hmm. lost and things like that. Yeah. So, and we've actually, you know, as I have strung together like five, eight city tours off of that, like, they're like, yo, I got like, you know what I'm saying? Two bars I could get into in one location, three Airbnbs in one spot and then like an art gallery in this one city. And I'm like, man, that's, that's cool. Like one is interesting. It makes it really interesting like yeah. content. You know, right. and then two, like you said, like it, I, it, especially in the beginning journey, you know, it looks better, I think, for those really intimate shows to be in those types of locations because mm -hmm. absolutely, really, really official venues don't set like a vibe, in my opinion. You know? Right. Like you, unless you kind of come in and you put your artistic eye to the venue, but most venues, if you just let them be the way they are, they're not really. I don't, they're not really interesting unless you're going to like the really big venues then they're expensive you know what I'm saying right, <laughs> like, exactly. yeah. Yeah. so then you're playing that game but doing it in these like one-off places where it's like there's something else during this other time like they already have a certain aesthetic that they already have a certain style you just need, need to be the music equipment you know what I'm saying boom just like that you got a venue yeah exactly and if you give people a good yeah. experience they're gonna like brag about how awesome that show was in a clothing yeah. store art gallery and like, they're not gonna say oh, there's only 20 people there. They're going to say it was packed or nobody else could get yeah. in. Um, yeah. like, so they're not going to talk about the capacity of it. They're just going to talk about how cool it was. Um, yeah. Which is such a great way for, as you said, for content and brand building. I love that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Tell, tell, me, more about, tell me more about that festival uh, that you guys put on. Is that the only event you guys put on? You guys promote other shows? Um, and then how many yeah. artists are on the festival? How long is it? Yeah, so the, the festival is called Blue Summer. We've been doing it for about three years now. I want okay. to say. Yeah. So three years. Um met a, a couple of friends here in Atlanta. We like 
tried wanted to put a show together uh just to just actually the friend from Orlando I was telling you about, he had just moved here and he, he just had these wild dreams of putting a show together. And I was like, <laughs> I'm like, oh man, it's, it's not as hard as you think it is. Like, but it happened all the time. But what was cool about it was that very first one went way better than we thought it was going to go. Like we were expecting maybe like 30, 40 people. We maybe had like a hundred, like 120 or so That's people great. come out. Yeah, and we were yeah. like, oh shit, you know what I'm saying? Like, okay, there's, there's, there's something here. Yeah. Uh, so that we kind of have, uh, I guess a theme to it where our big thing is being really close to the culture of the artists in Atlanta. So really staying on top of what artists here are, are interesting or are bubbling or kind of doing their thing. And then also bringing in artists that we think the scene here would like, but they don't mm -hmm. come through here, you know what I'm saying, often. Right. So we don't necessarily try to go for like the super top of the line A acts, but just something that would be interesting and would compliment and at least bring out a base, you know. Mm -hmm. cool. uh, so it's given us a really, a really cool like, community foothold and we've been able to build with some artists before they got into like better positions. Like there are artists that we put on to shows, you know, last year or two years ago that if we booked them today, they would bring out way more people than they brought in. And mm -hmm. they're like excited to come and do it again because we put on these interesting and cool looking shows for them before yeah. or they kind of got there. So we, we, we're more invested into that, but then we have, um, we, we do one off shows for artists. So okay, like I said, before all of this kind of, kind of kind of happened before the whole COVID thing happened. We were starting to expand to the space of like running tours for artists, so like being the Atlanta tour stop. Oh, cool. Kind of awesome. like maintain, maintain the whole thing for them. And then mm -hmm. like doing kind of like one-off theme shows for different brands. Like we did a show for Truly, the, like the alcoholic seltzer mm -hmm. brand. They wanted to do like a really community oriented, like a uh, rap show type of thing. Awesome. Um, so the festival is our main priority, but like I said, we want to move it into a space of being able to be that you know guarantee gonna sell out for you gonna do gonna be dope for you spot uh yeah. for atlanta and we try to use our knowledge of one the scene here because atlanta's a very particular scene atlanta's one of those places where you have to either be like really big mm -hmm. you know like like have a certain level of i would argue at least like you know b plus artists or higher or you have to be really connected to like the local scene here like people have right. to know who you are people have to be familiar with you if you if you fit Somewhere awkwardly in the middle, like your show's not gonna go well here. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, it's not gonna, it's not gonna go well here. So, uh, so, so it's like you will get. Oh, my so, bad. What so, you so, sorry. So, so you guys are promoting shows in Atlanta. So you like, like, are bringing in touring acts. So are you working like with agents and um, actually like acting like as a traditional promoter? Yeah, yeah. That's so awesome. we, yeah. So we, uh, like I said, we were just kind of thrown into that space the moment we decided to book an act with a fan base. You know, that was the first time um, we wanted to book this guy. I can't remember the artist. This artist by the name of um, I can't even think of his name. I don't want to get it wrong, but we were trying to pick this, this this bigger artist that we knew would bring a bass out, and that was our first, you know, smack uh, smack with a paradigm agent. You know, what I'm saying it's our first time, uh, awesome. first time even learning about things. I, I know personally that was the first time I heard of. I think what is it like a work order, like the the order the uh, the show order, like and some they were just like yo send over the order. I'm like the order. Yeah, it's like the order is like, and once he sent it, he's like, Yeah, the order, like, you've never heard of an order, like, I thought you guys were promoters. I'm like, Nah, bro. This is, <laughs> like, yeah, but this is the first time we've done this, and then he sent over like this whole work order thing for us, and I was like, Okay, but so you know, we it, it's been a cool ride, man, but yeah, so like, just dipping into that space, we try to as as much as possible go through the artist, mm -hmm. um, because of the run around with Asia sometimes, um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, I don't know. I, I think it's interesting because I think that I, I have, I have certain hard opinions about agents. Like I don't, I don't love them, but like, I don't hate them. You know what I'm saying? Like I get, so I get to love hate. <laughs> yeah. Very, very love and hate. Very like, man, really, man. Like cause we've been in situations where we talked to the artists and the artists was excited about it. And then we get to the agent. Oh, the agent like, get uh, pissed. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, uh. we, we actually had one act that it was actually funny. He had an agent. We even know he had an agent until, the agent called us after the event asking about the payment. And I thought it was like, uh, like a scam. <laughs> after I'm like, the event. Yeah, I'm like, bro, I'm, I've never talked to you before. Like, I, like I, way I to pay gonna, attention to your artist. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I was gonna pay the money directly to the artist. Like, and I hit the artist, he's like, oh yeah, that's my agent. I was like, bro, you got an agent this whole time? Like, and it was like, we didn't, we didn't, even, we didn't even know, it was crazy. But right. uh, but I mean, he was that agent was pretty cool. Like, he just was like, yeah, man, like, he didn't tell me. He just kind of like flew out to Atlanta and did the show. You know what I'm saying? Like, he just <laughs> told me about it, like, today. So. I don't know, man. It's, it's the the event the event space is, is interesting. I, we meet a lot of really interesting people. Mm -hmm. 
I, I feel like I learned a lot of things that are applicable to the marketing stuff, you know, because one, it's, it's, it's a different type of game you have to play even in the marketing world. Um, but then two, it's so many things that like, once I see it from that side, I can apply it to artists being able to set their own shows and their own tours up, you know what I'm saying? It's like, sure. I, I get it. Like, I, and I've been a part of, I even have friends who have been doing it longer than me that are, you know, have been doing it on bigger scales than me that, like I have friends that have strung together like 12, 15 city tours, you know what I'm saying? Have, or That's been awesome. the people that, that started out doing like, you know, a three city regional tour for an artist. And then two years later they do like, like I said, the 10, 12, 15 city tours for the mm-hmm. artists because they, they put their work in. So like, and I see what they've gotten out of it and like what it does to them as far as the other stuff they want to do. So like, I don't know, I, I think the events is one of those things that like, if you have the, the stomach for it and the capacity <laughs> for it, and like the team for it, I, I think it's one probably one of the best networking things you'll ever do. Yeah, like we talk, we we, have, we talk to agents, we talk to managers, we talk to artists. Because mm-hmm. everybody wants to make money. You're paying people. Everybody wants to make exactly. money. Exactly. So everybody, everybody wants to talk to you. you know what I'm so it, it's funny uh, that you say if you have the, the ability to stomach doing shows, because I mean it's like it's like gambling. I don't know. Yeah. Um, or, you, yeah. What, what were you gonna say? Well, I was gonna say like that. Yes, it is the, the gambling aspect. Actually, I, I wasn't even thinking of the gambling aspect when I said it, but you, that's actually, <laughs> yeah, that's that's a whole another stress stress point. Um, yeah. So, but I, I think the the gambling, the gambling is cool because if you're creative enough and like I said, as you start doing this, more people talk to you, right? And the more people that talk to you, the more your resources open up, and next thing you know, you're stringing together. Like we've strung together shows that look like we put way more money than we put into it and like yeah. people are looking like yo like you guys must be I'm like you know, we, we we knew some people you know we, we pulled some cars <laughs> that we that we picked up along the way yeah. uh, but all of it came through doing that type of stuff but i mean more so just like um like me personally when we first started doing it like i said the very first event for me i never intended to keep doing it we it was supposed to be mm-hmm. a one-off event and like we was gonna do one good job keep moving you know yeah and like, <laughs> I, I like personally I don't like going to events. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not a big events person. Like, I go to concerts and stuff, but like, I don't go to them a lot. But then when you're working events, you have, like, you know, three events booked out in a month, and it's like, hey, man, I have to be, you know, I have to be, I have to be very social this week. I have to talk yeah, to a lot of people. So it's I, tough I, when you're I mean, introverted, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I met other, like, I met other promoters who are like that. Who said, like, yeah, bro, like, you know, and, and, like that's just me personally. Like, luckily. Luckily, I have a team around me, and like they kind of fill in a lot of the roles that like I know mm-hmm. I wouldn't. So like, mm-hmm. at least two of the other team members are very extroverted people. Like they're extremely extroverted. So like, right. if I don't feel like you know talking to something, they got it. They got. It. They got it. I can handle <laughs> yeah. all the. Other, yeah, they, I can handle all the other stuff. And like, I think that that's kind of really big with it because I started out with an original team trying to do to, to do shows. Um, maybe when I first like first ever moved to Atlanta, and like the big thing I even saw out the gate is that. It's hard to do alone for even that reason. It's like, oh, yeah. the per- personality things you can't even control, but just two, the sheer amount of manpower it takes to put together <laughs> an event. Oh, yeah. Like, will, will a lot drive that goes into in, it. Yeah, it will drive you insane. Like, I've seen people with bigger teams than ours, and, you know, and it still looks hectic, you know, or even mm-hmm. we think about something like a rolling loud that employs literally like hundreds of employees. And I, I literally think about, because the way we're trying to scale it, if, if, projections go right we'll be similar we'll be in similar spaces and it's like it literally is like something i think about like man that's a lot of people to manage like that's a lot of like people yeah. to look after but is, is, that, that, is that you guys goal are you guys trying to promote more shows and start doing like little like regional tours for artists yeah so like i said we want to build a faction of it out to being being that like go to atlanta spot for artists that cool. want to tour, tour through here but the bigger goal for the festival is to like make it i don't want to say as big as possible because i always hate when people say that yeah, <laughs> it's possible, but it's like, but uh, like I think we want to build to like a comfortable, maybe like fifteen to twenty thousand capacity, awesome. and, and still um, can, can maintain that experience that you guys provide because I think that's a really yeah. cool element that you guys add those those other yeah. elements to it. Um, yeah, is that, that that's the challenge that we've kind of seen that comes with it, and even talking to like people who are just a part of like we have mentors and stuff that are part of like bigger festivals and stuff that are coaching us through it, making us you know be super realistic about how long the process is gonna take. Um, mm-hmm. And like trying to, you know, coach us through some of the things, but it's like, it, it's, it's, we're on a good path. I think every event has grown and we're, mm-hmm. we've gotten taken more serious by even major artists. Like there are major That's artists awesome. that we've had reach out to us about doing it because they follow the smaller artists that we booked and they just were cool with them. You know what I'm saying? It's like, man, like mm-hmm. stuff you wouldn't even think would happen. Right. So I, I personally think we're heading in the right direction. You know, I think That's that awesome. once, yeah. once we figure out how we can, 
it's just our challenge now is figuring out. Like I said, we were in a, a growing event. We weren't an established festival. We were in the process of like trying to like scale a little bit this year. Our goal this year was to like scale about maybe like 300, 400%, something like that. That's awesome. Uh, but now everything is turned towards yeah. live, <laughs> live events, like, you know what I'm saying? Like virtual events, virtual yeah, experiences. Yeah. And like, so that's even something that now we're trying to figure out how to transition into as quickly as possible with the base that we're trying to reach and the people that we want to use. Sure. And adapt, you know what I'm saying? So it's like it's a whole new challenge, man. Like it's always it's always a challenge in the in the in the, in the show business, man. <laughs> it is. I, I need to connect you with a, a buddy of mine from Miami. Uh, he's been on the podcast too, Jovan Polanco. He has okay. a company called uh, Swerve Entertainment, okay. and okay. they do some really like cool hip hop shows. They started just in Miami at first, and now they're starting to expand like through shows all over Florida. Um, so it could be you know a really great potential partner that's close by. So I'll make, I'll make sure to connect you with him um, when, we're, when we're offline. Oh, yeah, um, thank you man appreciate it yeah so, so you guys are like really good at marketing um like I've, I've heard some some of your stuff online on your on your channel uh on on from past interviews do you feel like those marketing skills have helped you like promoting some some lesser known artists because i always say the big, big agents right so an agent that represents drake or Lil wayne or name the yeah. artist right they always yeah. have baby bands or baby artists but people are yeah. just starting out that nobody knows yet um but that's like how, and you mentioned with, by doing shows, you meet managers, agents, publicists, and so on, right? I, feel like I always say it's the yeah. ultimate gateway drug to the industry to promote shows because yeah. you connect it to so many people Everybody. so fast. Yeah. So a lot of times you want to take risks at promoting artists that you don't really, but that people don't, maybe not really know, um, but because those agents are representing bigger artists that you want to have a connection with. Do you feel yeah. like your marketing skills have helped, um, I guess, sell more tickets than that artists normally wouldn't um, create like a better experience for them? Yeah, I mean, the a lot of our like marketing strategies were developed around developing artists, you know, because mm. I I didn't come into marketing with bigger artists around me to practice with. Like I had to start very like ground level. Like my very first yeah. client was a guy I just met on the internet, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> that just was like, Oh bro, I got a couple hundred dollars. You say you know what you're doing, like, let's do it. I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. cool, let's do it, you know. And then my second client was an art a local artist, uh that a friend of mine recommended to me, actually the friend that I said uh, also does like tours and stuff. Um, mm-hmm. So we started out doing a lot of stuff around these emerging artists. So these artists trying to develop fan bases and that's still a large part of our clientele. Like I would argue like maybe 70, 80% of our clientele is artists trying to cultivate a fan base to get into that, like to get into that stuff. So, but there are also ideas that artists with fan bases, if they were to enact the same things, they usually end up working out a lot better because they already yeah. have an audience to act as exactly. that, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, we look at it like the game, the way you play the game in marketing is the same, whether you're emerging or established, right? right. You have to create content, you have to figure out what that looks like for your audience, you have to engage, yeah. you have to figure out how to create interesting experiences or things for them to do. Like that's, that's the game, no matter if you have 10 or 100 million followers, right? Or 100 mm. million fans. Right. Um, so sure. I think that our challenge has been getting every, getting people to understand that because mm-hmm. a lot of the things that we talk about are one like new. You know what I'm saying? You know, a lot of industry is slow to jump on new. Like here we are, running like ooh TikTok, ooh Facebook ads, ooh right. YouTube ads. You know, so like we got it's like whoa, you know, slow down, man. Like yeah. we're, we're still working <laughs> working this over here. So that's been a lot of our challenges, like getting people to see it. Like yo, this can work no matter where you are. But mm-hmm. we've worked ourselves into positions to where we have case studies, we have examples of artists across the spectrum. Like we have clients that like get millions of streams and we've ran like really, really successful, like viral campaigns for them down to, we have artists that when they joined us, they have virtually no fan base and we you know, something like created something for them to start with. Mm-hmm. And I think of course, the longer term that we're able to work with these artists, the more we're able to like develop their marketing strategy and content strategy down to something that really fits them. Cause we're really big. Like one of our company's name is being really transparent mm-hmm. with artists and just letting them know like, yo, like a month's worth of marketing really isn't shit. Like in the right. degree of it, it's going to take a minute to like, you're really just, you're really just paying for testing at that point. Like you're paying to know a good direction to start moving in. Like, right, but exactly. we don't know the direction. Cause like, you know, I tell everyone all the time, like I can tell you what I think all day, but until we put it out there and look at it, nobody really knows. You know? so we right. don't really know. Yep, um, exactly. But so sometimes we'll get clients that like they want us to come along and build that out for them long term, handle it for them. Sometimes clients that like we may create a cultivated base for them to where maybe they may not have the budget to afford us long term, but they can at least like they listen to us and they listen to like 
us coaching them through the content stuff, then it's like, okay, we've at least given you a base of people that if you have no money, like you can still grow. You know what I'm saying? Like it'll be, it won't be as fast as it was when you were spending the money with us, but we've at least put you in a position that you can continue building yourself. You know, it's right. just, it's just going to be a lot foundation more foundation now. Yeah. So, yeah. um, so like to, that's been, to, to go backwards a little bit, sorry about that. Um, to go backwards a little bit, I guess, tell everyone kind of what, what your guys' company is and all the different services that, that you offer. We kind of, we kind of just jumped right in yeah, yeah, we did and skipped over that part. Um, <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, so I, I, I co-founded a, a, a digital marketing agency called Contra Brand Agency. And okay. um, the big services that we offer are kind of like influencer marketing, uh, programmatic advertising, mostly in the spaces of Facebook, YouTube, uh, TikTok, we're one of the only marketing agencies that has access to the TikTok ad platform. That's awesome. Um, and then we're really big in the influencer space. So influencers on Instagram, YouTube, uh, TikTok, again, we're really big on like those because we try to tackle every marketing campaign from two sides, right? We feel like the programmatic stuff is the foundational, the foundational stuff. It's mm -hmm. easy to set up. Once you find something that, that you can test out, you can scale it up or down, depending on what your budget is. It's, it's the most controllable thing that you have out of everything right. you can do. You know what I'm saying? It's the most stable of everything. So we're like, okay, cool, we can get this going. And then we look at influencers more so of like cultural hacking, right? Like with TikTok, we're trying to insert your song into the culture of TikTok and the way the videos move out. On Instagram, we're trying to attack, you know what I'm saying, different content niches that like promote people or just promote to the type of audience that may like you, but you no, know, fit you in there in a non-musical way. So like we look at a lot of that stuff as like culture hacking. And then um, we just kind of see that bringing those two together has given us really, really practical, scalable campaigns. Because at the end of the day, like I said, we're content marketers. Right. So our, most of our ideas, like our best ideas fall around a, like great content being created or even just like unique content to you. Cause we've had some things work before that we never would have guessed would have worked. You know what I'm saying? We've had mm -hmm. some things that didn't work that we thought we're just going to like blow everybody away, you know? Um, but it's still that game that going back to what we were first talking about, it's still a game that you're going to have to play. You know what I'm saying? Like you still right. have to figure it out. So if it doesn't work, we, we just got to get back, start running and figure yeah. out why it didn't work. Um, and we just have kind of prided ourselves as an agency on one being super transparent. Uh, we also have me and my business partner, Sean, also have a YouTube channel called Brand Man. And we talk about the exact things that we do. You know, like, there's nothing that we do in our process that you can't go back and find a trail of us talking about doing it or right. teaching it to some extent, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and so I think we, we have that going for us where especially with a lot of these like marketing agencies that you find online where they're rooted in like mystery and you don't really know mm -hmm. who's behind it. It's like, we're like, yo, it's us. You know what I'm saying? This is what we do. You can go learn about it over here. Uh, so I, that, I think that kind of helps us. And then we, we try to as best find the best way to get you in front of your base without having to go through gatekeepers. Because right. if we can figure that out, the gatekeepers will come. You know what I'm saying? Like the gatekeepers, the gates will fall down. But, and exactly. it's cool because it, I tell people all the time, like, yo, if you can, like, there's no one in the world that can stop you from running a Facebook ad except for you. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're right, not, exactly. like, paying a bill or something. <laughs> Influencers don't care if you're an uh, industry, you know what I'm saying, billboard, top billboard artist, or if you're, like, a local whoever, like, they like your music and you, you have the money to pay them and do good work. Like, they'll work with you. So, like, exactly. those are two things that, like, no matter who or what situation you're in, you can do that, it works. And then once you build yourself to a certain point, gatekeepers come so we've, right. we've been building a lot of our just our marketing strategies around that tactic we're very direct to consumer um we're very you know make sure our clients are engaging with their base making sure they're talking to them building communities one-on-one -on -one, and then very like on their asses about like yo like let's figure out this content stuff mm -hmm. uh, but it's and it's 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 interesting work because we get to see so many other different concepts work or fail, but also from different angles, you know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. like, like I said, there we've had clients before where they posted something and like, I couldn't tell you why it went viral, but it went viral. Right. We capitalized on it and we took it and ran with the, with the things that we would do with you know, other stuff and like really fleshed it out. Uh, and then we've had some things that like, we were like, no, like this is gonna work. Like we, we see where this is going, this is gonna work. Um, but we get to collect so much data and see so many things from so many different angles that I think it's given us a really systemized approach to building artists out, you know, um, mm -hmm. to building them out in non-traditional ways, or at least non-traditional for now. Um, and right, then yeah. also, I, like, I really finding where's... Where, yeah, no, I, I, I love that. He's <laughs> not, not non-traditional for now. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let me, let me, let me uh, share something yeah. with you real quick. There's a, a graphic uh, that I okay. created. Um, let me see that. So it's like the traditional artist team, right? So um, like a lot of artists, you have this really cool video on your Instagram of either hiring or developing your team, um, which is something I want you to talk about in All a right. second. But the tra- traditional artist team, like, you know, people try to find a manager, an attorney, booking agent, uh, label, and so on, right? But I don't think that's the way the music industry works anymore these days. There's many other ways. So I kind of created this, this bubble, the DIY team, where you focus on maybe getting coaches or marketing agencies, um, getting someone to handle label services. Yeah. Um, like there's an artist named Love that like, is complete, does completely independent. And he has a person on his team that he hired that she just handles anything that a label would normally handle um, as far as distribution and promotion goes. Okay. Um, I guess what are your kind of thoughts on where – artists should start. Um, can I explain that concept of maybe hiring your team or developing your team? Um, and when someone's like ready to go beyond just being a one man show, um, where should they start building their team? A hundred percent content team. Cause the content team mm-hmm. is going to be the, the uh, content is like 60% of the game today. So yep. like, if you don't start there, you know what I'm saying? Then you're not even really competing at even like a, a lower level, you know? Um, Cause you need content to start spreading stuff out. So I, I, I think that, you know, of course every artist is different, but I think that starting with someone who can produce high quality visuals for you in the form of cover art, graphics, banners for your socials and stuff like that, that person and the video guy, like someone that understands like video composition, um, editing, you know, saying Adobe Premiere, Final Cut, all that stuff. Like someone that's good at that. I think starting there outside of like your artistic teams, so, like your engineers or whoever does right. that for you. You know what I'm I think content team first. Um, and then I think everything from there is just very situational. Mm-hmm. So I know artists who their team is their manager, like us and like a publish like a publishing company that's signed to. And then mm-hmm. the other artists like their team is like their label, you know what I'm saying? The other artists, right. their team is like their they have just an agent, you know what I'm saying? Like that's like, but it makes sense for whatever strategy they have for themselves and like it's it's been working for them. Um, but I think that every every artist needs to start with the content team because mm-hmm, that's, like, that's, that's, that's that digs it. Like nobody cares about your lawyer, like or at least fans don't. You know what I'm fans don't yeah. care who your lawyer is. Fans don't care what publishing company you're signed to. Fans don't care who your booking agent is. Fans don't care. Do I like what you're producing and putting in front of me <laughs> on these social yeah. media platforms? Exactly. And all of that work comes back to you and your content team. You know what I'm saying? So I think that every artist should really sit down with. And I would say if it's hopefully. It's of the, the visual people on your team, but also someone that understands like branding and aesthetics. Um, because mm-hmm. some people just aren't good at like you know making sure their look looks a certain way or the video. So, like, I don't think there's anything wrong with needing help with that. And then I would say from there, uh, next up, it's probably a marketing team to be real. Uh, either, yeah. either your next step from the content team needs to be getting someone that understands marketing or you yourself learning marketing or getting someone like getting someone around you to learn marketing. Uh, Cause I don't even necessarily, like, I tell some of our clients all the time, like, yo, we have to build you up to the point where if you can't afford to hire us anymore, you at least have a good understanding of what to do to keep doing. So like our work wasn't wasted and mm-hmm. the money wasn't wasted. You know what I'm saying? Like, cause momentum yeah, is a real exactly. thing. You know what I'm saying? Momentum is a very real thing. Like mm-hmm. you can kill off and they can fuck up everything. Um, but like, exactly, if, yeah. I, I get it when artists are like, yo, you know, a lot of these marketing companies are scams and the really good ones charge a lot. And it's like, yeah, but a lot of the stuff that we talk about isn't hard. Like running a Facebook ad isn't hard. You know what I'm I took, it's, it's tedious, but right. it's not hard. You know what I'm saying? Um, or even exactly. uh, reaching out to reaching out to the influencers isn't complicated. It's, it's, it's tedious again. It can be annoying mm-hmm. just like reaching out to anybody, but it's not hard, you know? So even if it's not you, somebody around you needs to understand it. Somebody around you needs to understand like building into niches, uh, how to understand like analytics and demographics and like how to convert numbers into like ideas and thought processes. You know, like somebody needs to understand those things. I think that right. those two things alone, the content team and the marketing people, whoever understand you, like that's, I think that's enough to get started. And then everything from there is just very, mm-hmm. you know, situational. Like, do you need a lawyer for, if, are you about to sign something? Then yeah, of course, go get a lawyer. You know exactly. what I'm saying? Like, please yeah. go get a lawyer. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> like uh, if you, if you, I, I the booking agent one is interesting. I, I think that going back to our conversation around the traditional, like the non-traditional spaces, I don't mm-hmm. think you necessarily 
super, super need a booking agent out the gate. Maybe once you reach a certain point where maybe you're trying to get on like bigger festivals or bigger shows. And even then, those don't make sense to you for you until you're at a certain fan base level anyway. Right. So, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, like, I think just having someone that has the patience and the organizational skills to, like, do that, help you set, like, plan that stuff up is a good, good look, too, once you have a base. Yeah. But you're just ground zero, like, nothing content team marketing people all day. Yep. I completely agree with that. Couldn't yeah. agree more. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting with the, with the agents, too, because – you know, most artists want, like want to get an agent so they can book shows, but you can do it on your own. You can one probably book cooler yeah. shows in the beginning and promote them better. Like an agent, like anyone you add to your team is because you're expanding your business and you kind of are taking more of a CEO role and you other people to handle other parts of your business. So if you're playing mm-hmm. enough shows, then yeah, an agent can make sense as long as they can bring you to the next level. They can put you on those festivals or in a support slot with someone on a national tour. But other than that, you can do so much more damage yeah. on your own with yeah. a content team and marketing team. Yeah, um, exactly. And, and even, I, I would say even like with that, um, it's just, I, I think that you as an artist, especially when you're first building out, should always have as much ground level contact with these starting people that you're doing these shows and stuff with anyway. And just personally, you know what I'm saying? Like, we don't even always like dealing with book agents. Like, we've had situations where, <laughs> Like, like I said, I mean, we've had artists call us prices before, and then when it comes to going through the agent, it's like quadruple, you know what I'm saying? Because the agent right. has to get paid, the agency has exactly. to get paid. It's like, yep. so I, it just, I think, like, I think about some acts that wanted to do our event that we just lost on because it was like, we literally, once it came to going through the booking agent, we could not afford to book you. It didn't, or it, it didn't make sense. And we even went to uh, our ebook, so the, the the booking conference in Nashville, International mm-hmm. Entertainment Bookers thing. I, I can't mm-hmm. remember the name of it. But buyers. Buyers Association. International Entertainment Buyers, yeah, Association. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we went to that thing, we went to that conference, and I, there was a woman who was, like, talking about that, and I asked her, I was like, yo, like, how do booking agents determine the price of an act? And I was like, because we're getting these numbers back for these acts and they feel so arbitrary because it's like, where did, where are you pulling this number from? Like this act is not worth 5k. Like maybe he's worth like 2,500, you know, right. like 3k, but he's not worth 5k, 8k, what, like whatever. And like, she just looked me straight in my eye. I was like, yeah, we just like, we have to get paid. So like, we just, we have to set it at numbers that you're right. It doesn't make sense for you to pay that amount for this artist. That artist isn't worth this money. So then it puts us, the promoters in the weird spot, like, damn, we want to book you, but like, you're, you're like, you've been overpriced, you know? Right. Like, we want you to be paid. Like we would, we, we have a, a price that we're willing to negotiate. Like we're yeah. very open to like, you know, working stuff out to favor the artists. But like I said, we've gotten quotes that have been just ridiculous and it's been because of the agent. So, and I, I think that like, I'm thinking if we're going through that, who knows how many other bridges for other people have been brought. Oh, sure, yeah. The, the same situation. So I and, think and you can that, create deals where the artist can make more money, right? So maybe that's yeah. a smaller guarantee, but if you sell X amount of tickets, you get a bonus or you can just do a traditional uh, plus or versus deal where uh, once all the expenses are paid, the artist makes a percentage from whatever's left. Um, yeah. And, and if I hit the percentage faster because uh, the guarantee is a little lower and the expenses are hopefully a little lower, um, like everyone's working together and then the goal should be for the artists to get into percentage because I always say if they're getting the percentage, everyone's happy because the yeah. venue's making money, the promoter's making money and the artist is making money. Yeah. And we try to do percentages when the artists are down. Like, but that's another one of those things that is like, is trying to get them to understand like, yo, like, cause we, we had, we actually had a friend uh, that we booked and he, this was around the time he had just started really developing a fan base. So he hadn't done a show since just, he had a, a video start to go viral on YouTube. He started getting a lot of traffic on Instagram. His Spotify numbers started going up. And he hadn't done a, a show to really like gauge where, no, what, uh, like where his base was at as far as pulling people out. Right. So we worked out the same percentage deal with him that we worked out with like all the local artists that we book. And like he ended up making like like he ended up making way more money though. Like we were going to pay him out the gate. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Like because like yeah. when we were looking at the numbers at the end, we was like, dang, bro, he made this much. Like he bought this many, like he sold this many tickets, and we're looking at like he sold like a shit ton of tickets. You know what I'm saying? I was like, mm-hmm. so and I was like, yeah, bro, like we were initially going to pay you this, and I know he would have took it, you know. <laughs> like I know for a fact he would he would have taken it. And yeah. so I, I think about and we we've had a lot of acts that have been open to that because we try to leverage that to get bigger acts. So we'll be like, yo. Okay, what do you want? You want you want eighty five hundred? Okay, we don't have eighty five hundred. We'll give you six K and like you know what I'm saying, like fifteen twenty percent of ticket sales 
pre door, you know what I'm saying? Something like right. that. And mm-hmm. like we project that it should bring you out somewhere between seventy five hundred and nine k. You know what I'm saying? Like right. it should bring you somewhere. You that, if, yeah, if you think you're gonna do what you think you're gonna do, you're gonna walk away with my money. We're gonna give you. Yeah, uh, and, and artists that are confident in their either their own marketing or their marketing mm-hmm. team, right? So if it's an artist that has you guys doing the marketing, uh, mm-hmm. it's almost better to almost like take the gamble. Like, hey, you know what? Give me seventy yeah. percent of the door. I will take no guarantee, and I know we're gonna pack this place, and I'll walk with way more money than you would have guaranteed me anyway. Yeah, exactly, man. Especially when your when your ticket prices started hitting like the fifteen, twenty, twenty five dollars. Like, if you can comfortably charge someone twenty dollars, like you should be doing percentages. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. Like, 20, like <laughs> you should be doing percentages like all the way. Because like I said, like what we're going to have to negotiate with you. Like, I mean, you know, don't get me wrong. We'll take the deal. We're not never against saving some money on something. But <laughs> if I'm out of my promoter bag, it's like you could make way more money doing it this way, the way we mm-hmm. want to do it with you. Yeah, I like that your agency also has like managers that are, I guess, smart enough to like bring their artists to you guys. Um, because I always say like, how do you know like who is the right like the right person to hire for your team, right? Because yeah. there's some I've worked with so many managers and labels and even promoters that have absolutely no clue when it comes to promoting. They they think they know because they run a bunch of Facebook ads, um, mm-hmm. probably all under the same ad account um, for multiple different artists. So their ad account analytics are all jacked up already um and it just drives me nuts when i see someone spend hundreds of dollars promoting a flyer like (laughs) here's the flyer for a show and i'm just boosting the post for my facebook and spending 200 bucks that's so lazy (laughs) um (laughs) i guess how how does someone know um to either like so if they're gonna hire a content like you know content team and a marketing team um but they're interested in getting a manager to take on some more of the industry roles um because they Mm -hmm. just understand the music industry uh better um like, how do you know who's a good manager and who isn't and maybe who's open-minded enough to say, hey, uh, or humble enough to say, I'm not that great at marketing, but I know these guys that are great at it. We should hire them and add them to the team. Like, how do you know, like, what, like how do you figure out what, who's a good manager? I mean, I, I, I think exactly that. I think uh, from my experience of just dealing with managers, um, the, the ones that I always like working with are the ones that are easy to work with. They mm-hmm. don't like, they don't, super like they control they keep you stable but they also understand letting people do their jobs and building that network and then also being you know what I'm saying like humble enough to be like yo like, i don't know what the fuck you're going on that's why i hired you that's why i reached out to you you know exactly. <laughs> uh so i think and how do you i don't know I, I can't really i don't really know how to figure out what person has those other than i guess you yourself as an artist has to be informed on certain things so that you can have conversations with your manager about certain things and then see yep. if that on it. Cause like if, if you're telling your manager, yo, we need to find a guy to run Facebook ads. And he's like, what is that? It's like, yo, bro, like, what are you doing? You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> what, like what, what's going on? Um, or just so ask your manager I, about ad funnels or the customer journey. Uh, it's like, Hey, how are we going to take my brand through the customer journey? And if that person just stares at you with <laughs> blank stares, yeah. it's run. <laughs> it's like, man, look, somebody, we need to find someone. So, I, cause we, we've had managers that, like I said, um, they're like younger guys who are managing younger acts and they'll get to the point. where so they'll be like, yeah, I'll be real. Like we can't afford it. Like, can we, can we learn from you? And like, we have resources where we teach people how to do the same thing. And we mm-hmm. have even had people that have applied to us as clients. And we've been honest with them. Like, yo, like, okay, you're telling us you have a, a AK budget, but to be real with you, you would be better off just paying for this course, learning how to do it. And then breaking that AK out, you know what I'm saying? Over mm-hmm. into seven K over how many months opposed to like right. what we would have to spend with it. Right. Um, so like we're, we're real cool with, like I said, of course we want to make as much money as we can. We want to, we want to, we want to be out here. You know what I'm saying? But yeah. like, just realistically, we know the value of just getting artists and their teams to just even think about doing it in general. You know what I'm saying? And we're much, we're much more into that than the bag per se. The bag comes with putting that out there. So, right. you know? um, but yeah, I think just that, just, you have to be up on game yourself. Cause I met a lot of artists, man, who I never forget. I have a friend out here named Portia who does these industry networking events and she had this one event where it was all about djs so it was like mm-hmm. a bunch of notable djs talking about like how djs need to move you know, move in 2019 new industry artists a really interesting panel and i remember i was standing by the door and there was this artist that walked past me and i heard someone ask him uh yo where are you going and he's like, i'm about to leave and he's like you're not gonna stick around for the panel and he was like nah like my manager's here like he got that he needs to know i'm like dang bro like that's how you get scammed. That's how you get scammed, bro. Like that's how yeah. you get, that's how you get scammed. And I was like, and I remember the first thing I thought was like, man, bro, he's gonna get scammed by somebody. Somebody's gonna scam the hell out of him. Yeah. He's gonna be hurt. 
uh, you but know, artists have to know that they're the, the CEO and a yeah. successful like CEO, like business owner or yeah. a responsible business owner, regardless of what industry it is, they're going to learn more about their industry. They're going to learn about accounting. They're going to learn about marketing. They're going to learn yeah. about budgeting. Uh, and artists should be doing the same because they're the CEOs. Yeah. Uh, you should know enough. You should know enough to know what you're not good at and where you need to delegate. And you don't know that until you at least attempt to try it out or at least dig into it, you know, because like, like us as business owners, like you said, like we look at it the same way. There are a lot of things that have to get done on the day to day as a company. Like, I don't want to do it. You know what I'm like, mm-hmm. I'm not good at it. Like, I suck at, I don't suck at graphics, but I would prefer not to do graphic design work. Right. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, now I know enough to know that if I had to do it, I could do it. Like, if I ever got put in a situation where it was just me, and my laptop and I needed a graphic done, I can do it. Right. But, you know, I've, I know that I don't want to do it. And I think everyone should be at that place. Like, yeah, you don't, like, you don't have to run your marketing campaigns forever, but at least understand enough about it so that when you're hiring somebody, you're talking to them, you know what questions to ask to see exactly. if you want to put your money in the right places. You know um, that you know, they know like, what they're doing. Yeah, exactly. Because like, if you don't know, if I'm asking you about custom audiences and pixeling and, you know what I'm saying, like, like different ads, and I'm like, if I was like, oh, where you talk, where's the traffic at? Like you'd be like, yo, I'm not, I'm not giving you, I'm not giving you any money. You know, right. but like if 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 I just hop on, I'm like, yo, we run ads and you don't know anything about ads and like all I, like you said, all I do is go boost the post, get access to your Instagram and boost the post. Run. Like <laughs> Yeah, it's like, come on, man. Um so yeah, I think like I said, I, I just think knowing enough to know what you don't want to do is mm-hmm. is is huge, you know what I'm saying? Like but like but like knowing so enough focus about focus on your what strengths, you to, what you're good at yeah. and hire people that yeah. are good at your weaknesses. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, in, in October, so in October, you were on an episode of Creative Juice uh, with my buddy Circa, and that's kind of how I found out about you guys. And back right. then, so this was October, so about eight months ago, uh, you talked about the holy trinity of platforms. Um, I guess, can you share what, what that holy trinity of platforms is? And has that changed um, since TikTok has gotten bigger? Yeah, it has changed. I was actually going to okay. say that. So, yeah, so <laughs> I guess now, what, what's what's the word for, I don't know the word for, for like, after Trinity. I don't know what it is. But <laughs> now it's the, it's the holy that. So, Instagram, YouTube, uh, Spotify, and TikTok. Now TikTok. So, I say Spotify because Spotify is, like, the industry scoreboard. You know what right. I'm saying? That's a everyone, <laughs> yeah, everyone, like, runs and looks at your Spotify numbers. Uh, like, we look at it for the book acts. You know what I'm saying? We look at it when like when we clients apply to us and like, we look people care about we, we do too yeah 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 mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? people care about that so uh spotify on that youtube because i think youtube is youtube is the hardest platform to grow on but it's the most rewarding platform to grow on mm-hmm. like if you, once you build an audience on youtube like you're set you know what I'm oh you're not set but like you're it's a different type of audience over there you know what i'm saying um, right. uh instagram because i think instagram is like the cool platform instagram is the platform that everyone seems to be on the most even though like Facebook is bigger, like it, it seems like more people just culturally use Instagram a little bit bigger. And even influencers and those type of people tend to value Instagram a little bit more. We went to an influencer conference, maybe like before all of this happened. And there was one panel where all the influencers were talking about like, just the amount of like how much they wish they could just grow on Instagram. Like like YouTubers with millions of followers or subscribers on YouTube wishing they didn't have 800k on instagram you know what I'm saying? so like right. people just put a different type of weight into instagram and then instagram mm-hmm. in my opinion especially with the added weight of instagram ads um yeah. it's the easiest to kind of like niche into uh because there are a lot of different uh like blog style instagram pages you can use to post your content there's a there's an account for everything like if you're in the sports there's hella sports accounts there's beauty accounts there's, there's literally anything you can think of as right. an instagram account for so the way that you can market content on Instagram is way different than you can market on other stuff, but it, like you can get really detailed on that. Uh, and then even to go back to YouTube, um, YouTube advertising is one of my favorite ways to market because of how niche you can get with that. So add the benefits of growing a YouTube account with the way that you can niche with YouTube ads and like YouTube is a, one, another one up there. And then TikTok, TikTok because one, TikTok is the first social media platform where there is music promo going on 24 7 mm-hmm. and everyone is completely fine with it as long yeah. as it's done in an entertaining way right uh and then just because tiktok is still it's in it's in the early phases it's about to jump out they're about to mature a little bit and it's just about to change but the the word we've been preaching for a minute was that they're in the early phase and every platform when they first start out goes through a phase of okay we want everybody on this platform to be as big as possible because the bigger your audience is the more people you keep here so like right. literally if you like make good content and dive into it, like you can grow really fast on there you know what i'm saying like mm-hmm. everyone doesn't it's a it, it definitely is hard 
to figure your niche on it. But once you click and you find it, you can grow really fast. Like we know people who have grown from like, like a couple of hundred followers to like hundreds of thousands of followers in like days, weeks. You know what I'm right. saying? Um, I have a friend now that's actually going viral on that because of a cover video that she did. And like, oh, cool. she literally grew maybe like 90,000 followers over the course of like two weeks on there. You know what I'm saying? And wow. So the, the, the kind of like culture hack that you can do with that is, is, the same as other platforms, but it's also a little bit cheaper over there. Because mm -hmm. like I said, the platform hasn't matured yet. Like it's still in the infant phases. Right. A lot of those influencers are teenagers that this is the first time they've ever had someone asking them how much money do you charge? So they're, they're underpricing themselves. Uh, like we've had influencers with millions of followers charge us a couple hundred dollars. And the influencer with millions of followers on YouTube and Instagram would tax you. you know what I'm saying? It'd be, it'd oh yeah. Be easy, easy, <laughs> easy, easy couple of thousand dollars. Crazy. But, like on TikTok, <laughs> On TikTok, we've got influencers that have like six million followers, charges like eight hundred dollars or like a thousand dollars. It's crazy, you know yeah. what I'm saying? But um, and I think if you can get over there, and if you have the the personality and the content hustle to build yourself out on there, then cool, by all means, do it. Like I would suggest anybody do it if they can do it. Right. But you don't have to do it. Like if you get over there and you at least watch it enough to where you understand the culture mm -hmm. of it, how things move on there then anyone can build that song on there. Or like yeah. anyone that can understand how to make that song fit the, the culture, like like I said, the, the culture of TikTok. So mm -hmm. I think that just combining all those spaces makes a really a really interesting stronghold for artists because I don't see TikTok going anywhere anytime soon. Spotify is probably not going anywhere anytime right. soon. YouTube is mm -hmm. definitely not going anywhere no. anytime <laughs> soon. You know what I'm saying? Instagram probably isn't going anywhere anytime soon. Each right. of them has their, their different levels of difficulty of growing. Because like I said, Instagram and uh, Instagram and YouTube are probably the two hardest to grow on. Like, well, YouTube definitely. YouTube is the hardest. Instagram is probably the second hardest. Or yeah, Instagram is the second hardest. And I would say probably like Spotify and then TikTok. Or TikTok and then Spotify. Right, right. Um, each of them kind of has a different place. Like I would never recommend to anyone that they go like 120% into Spotify playlisting or anything of that. Like if you're growing it out through other means, yeah, but like, I would never recommend that. Like spread out into these other platforms that are more content oriented. Mm -hmm. um, but that's even outside- That's a good point. Um, sorry to cut you off, but uh, that's a good point with the Spotify, right? So one of the things I'm gonna ask you is, um, one of the biggest mistakes I ever, like always see people make, um, like artists make is, messaging random strangers on whatever social media platform and say, Hey, uh, check out my music and like my song, share my song. And it's like, I don't even know who you are. <laughs> Why should I exactly. share your song and like your song? So I mentioned the customer journey, like they're completely violating that, that journey. Um, I always say it's like walking into a bar and walking up to someone just, and just kissing them. And it's like, yeah. dude, <laughs> I don't Just, know you. Um, <laughs> so it's like, you have to create that awareness first. So, uh, you mentioned Spotify. Um, I feel like Spotify is kind of like a dead end, at least right now, because you can't really retarget people uh, that are listening to your music on, on Spotify, but you yeah. mentioned directing people to Spotify. So I guess, which platform would you recommend like artists start off on? And then at what point is it the right time of the, either the funnel of you know, music kind of language or customer journey to direct people to Spotify? Yeah, I would say um, probably Instagram or TikTok. Mm -hmm. uh, Instagram, like I said, if, if you have a bit more of a budget to play around with and you kind of understand the niches that you're going out there and you understand like making different pieces of content. So not even just content with you in it, but maybe going back to the basketball example, let's say you want to get in front of basketball fans. Maybe you mm -hmm. go create a, a, a highlight clip of like LeBron James dunks with your song underneath and then you get it distributed yeah. on like 20 NBA accounts. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. if, you, if you understand your audience to be able to do stuff like that, definitely Instagram. Um, and Instagram converts well to other stuff. So like, like you said, that's one of the big thing was, that's one of the big reasons I don't recommend going super heavy with Spotify playlistings because Spotify doesn't convert as well to other platforms as other platforms convert to Spotify. Right. Exactly. Um, and then, like you said, there it's, it's like a data black hole. If I get you in front of 100,000 listeners through playlists and you only have a retention of 500 listeners, you know what I'm saying, which, like, it's, you know, if it's the first time, it, it's not great, but it's not terrible, you know. Right. But I have no way to get back in front of those other 99,000 plus people that we missed. Like, we, we don't know why those people didn't, like, follow you or save the song we, we we don't we have no way to talk to them as opposed to right. like if i run an ad and a hundred thousand people see the ad 
but only 500 people like it enough to do something. It's like, cool. We have those people. We have those people. Right. Now. now we can retarget them. Now. Yeah, we can retarget them. We can talk to them. We can maybe this content wasn't the one that they like. Maybe they'll like something new for you. So it's like now you're you're starting to build out um, like a target audience. No, not target. Like a what's the word I'm looking for? Like a um, like a testing audience. You know, like a a warm mm-hmm. audience set to like to test right. stuff out in first before you take it out to these cold sets. Um, so and you can't do you can't do that with Spotify. They don't give you the ability to talk to anyone. They don't give you access to the data. Um, it's very limited in that type of stuff. So I always recommend yeah either Instagram, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube for real. Like I said, YouTube is gonna be a lot slower to grow on there. But if you're spending money on ads and you're being active on that, you will grow. And, and if you understand the whole mechanics of YouTube SEO and optimizing your channel and setting up, so it's nice and stuff. Like you'll grow on that, just be slow. But um, yeah, definitely. I think Instagram. You, you talked about um, doing advertising on, on YouTube as well. Um, I don't know if it's because of marketers, um, especially in the music industry, um, strict, focus strictly on Facebook and Instagram marketing. They don't really spend money on YouTube. Um, is it because the ad platform for YouTube is more, a little more complicated, not as easy to navigate as, as Facebook? Um, is it not as successful? Like why, why do you feel people almost completely ignore uh, YouTube? I, I think a lot of it has to do with the challenge of it too. Like I said, YouTube is hard. Like it's hard to go on YouTube. Like YouTube is not a, a game that like a platform you're just gonna hop on tomorrow and have like twenty thousand followers. It's not happening. Right. Or it yeah. might, but you know, it's probably it's probably not gonna happen. Um so I think that scares a lot of people away from it. I mean, I particularly don't think it's harder to run the Facebook ads. It's not as straightforward. Like mm. that may be what it is. It's definitely not as straightforward as, as Facebook ads. Like cause Facebook kinda like coaches you through the process of putting ad. YouTube kind of right. like, or Google just kind of like throws you into it. It's like, yo, here you go. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think, and I think that probably they probably try ads on there and didn't understand either the type of ad to use or they didn't, they didn't have any context for the numbers they were seeing. Cause we'll see it all the time. Like I, we, we, I had a talk with one of our clients a couple of months ago um, that we were running YouTube ad for. And he had a question about like the like the view ratio. He's like, yeah, man, you know, I was thinking we could start on the ad. I'm like, wow, man, you know, what's up? He's like, um, I just think that the views are kind of like outweighing the likes on it. And I go look at him like, no, nah, not really. Like you have a, I think you had like a two point, let's say like 2.4% like to view ratio, which does mm-hmm. sound low. But even if you look at bigger artists, like if you go look at something like Roddy Rich or like really huge artists that you know for a fact that having money spent on them, their like percentage would be like 1%, you know what I'm saying? Like 1.5%, right. 0.5%. Right. Uh, and only really, I've noticed like only really, really like super viral songs, like an old time role, like Doja Cat stuff, like those songs will have higher than average like percentage. Like I think, I think a good organic like percentage is probably like the view percentage is probably like five to 8%. Um, but if mm-hmm. you're spending money, then yeah, it's probably going to fall somewhere in that like one to 4% range. Right? Just be real. Cause mm-hmm. you're pushing yourself to people that don't know who you are as opposed right. to like when it's organic traffic, it's people that came and found you. So of course the conversions are going to be higher. So I mm-hmm. think getting people to understand. And when we broke it down to him, he's like, oh shit, you're right. Cause I just want to test it out with a couple of like other artists. Videos. You're right. Like this video had like 2%. I was like, yeah, bro. Like, I was like, it looks different to you because you're looking at bigger numbers, like a hundred million views. And you know what I'm saying? Like 58,000 likes, it looks like a lot. He's like, damn, that's a hundred million views. And 50. But then when you break it down, it's like, no, it's like 1.5%. Like that's, that's, right. that's not a lot. Like it's not high. Right. Uh, so I think that, but that just comes with them caring enough to dive into it and, and get context behind it because context comes with a lot of testing you know so a lot of trial and error to know because mm-hmm. we i mean we all were the same way i remember running ads and like man it's crazy this ad like this ad got twenty thousand views but it only got like eight subscribers out of it like am i doing something wrong and like you doing he's like no nah, that's just that's just how it is like it's just the way that's the way that the advertising band works and then i think most people don't understand that a lot of the game that gets played with advertising is in the retargeting. Like real savvy advertisers right. know that whatever happens on the front end is cool. We don't care about that. We just need them to see it so that we can retarget right. them again. Like that's all exactly. we care about. So it's like, like I said, going back, if your ass hits a hundred thousand people and only 400 people like it, cool, bro. You still hit a hundred thousand people. Like a hundred thousand people are still yeah. aware of you now and you can play exactly. around in that, in that data set and figure something out. So I think that's where mm-hmm. a lot of it comes from. But like I said, I personally, 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 uh, YouTube as my favorite advertising platform because of how niche you can get. Like with Instagram, Facebook, mm-hmm. someone or something has to be big enough for Facebook to recognize that as a keyword. Whereas with YouTube, right. as long as someone's videos are monetized, you can run your video as an ad to that video. So like you can right. target any artist, you know, so any artist that you feel like would make sense for you. 
So that has just created really interesting, like, targeting options for us. Of course, when it's good content, meets good audience, we've seen, like, some great, like, some really good stuff come out of it. And then even going back into the bigger thing, like, I don't think that, I don't think that ads alone are enough to break an artist, but unless you're just spending, like, a shit ton of money. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you're spending a lot of money, yeah, but usually it's not enough, but they're good foundational stuff. So, like, if you have a YouTube ad and you have that set up, it's like, cool, now you have this bringing in consistent data now you need to go do other youtube stuff go reach out to youtubers go get your music on platforms right. go push your existing audience over to it. like you can't just rely on the ad the ad is right. just a good padding for everything else it makes everything it as in my opinion make it easier to take risks on the other stuff because i know that if i spend five hundred dollars on this influencer whether it flopped or whether it does well i still have at least a consistent level of you know saying good results that i know are going to come out because we have this ad set up and like it makes exactly. it easier to take those risks than just like, oh man, I don't even have some foundation set up. So if I lose this money, I just uh, nothing is still going on. So I don't know. I think I think that's what it is. So we're 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 trying to get big on like teaching people how to do it. Um, like I said, like we have courses and stuff, um, brand man network where we teach artists how to do it. But I think a lot of that just comes from they just haven't played around with it enough. They haven't dove in and they just don't get it yet. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Do you think um with the, with the YouTube ads um. Once, so like the first ad that you run, right? That's what we, the marketers call this, the awareness, uh, creating awareness around an artist, or around a business or a brand, whatever. Um, and then when you retarget, that's when you kind of get into the education phase. You're trying to get them to watch a, another video now. Do you feel like when you retarget an audience the second or even third time that the, the ratio of subscribers uh, and all the other metrics go up as well? Yeah, definitely. Because like I said, like your first ad, you're, you're hitting people who have never heard of you before. I don't know who you are. Okay. But now when you're running it back, now this person goes like, oh, oh shit, like, I remember this girl from that exactly. other ad, or I remember this guy from that one video. Um, let me go check it out. So YouTube and Instagram, Facebook, we know it's higher view rates when we retarget. We do know, know it's higher conversion rates, lower cost per clicks, lower cost per views, because it's a warmed up audience. And then like that exactly. is the strategy that you have to get into when you're getting to ads is that, you have, like I said, a month of marketing doesn't give you shit. Like you don't get unless you're right. spending a lot of money, you don't you don't get nothing out of that. You know what I'm saying? But the, right. the strategies in long term stuff, like, all right, cool. I need to run this ad at, you know, fifteen hundred dollars a month for the next three months so that I can build up enough data to build a really sizable uh lookalike audience off of so that I can retarget this or so that I can target the ads to this new lookalike audience while also retargeting this new music video to this, you know, fifty percent warm audience. So it's like like that stuff comes over time or with a large budget, exactly. you know? but it's like, that's the game that you have to get comfortable knowing that you're about to play, which like, like we said, it's not a hard game to play. It's just, it's just tedious. You know, so it's like, I keep up with, but it's yeah, not hard. Time. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. At what point? So like one of the, I guess, things I always teach is if, you know, if you have an audience on any of those platforms, you're renting your audience from that platform. They can at any moment, any second can make a complete algorithm change and, it messes up your entire connection to that audience. So yeah. I always try to encourage artists to get someone either on your, your email list or a text messaging list or a messenger list um, to get them off the platform so you can communicate with them directly. Um, at what point would you introduce that, like trying to get someone on an email list uh, and would you do that first or would you try to get them on, on Spotify first? Uh, so I think, so with those, if the artist is willing to do it or has the capacity of the team to do it, we try to get them working on their email, that SMS list like, out the gate. Cause I'm like, right. you know, if we run it and you ask 50 people to do it and like eight people go do it, it's like, cool. You know, that adds up exactly. over time. It, 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 exactly. it'll, it'll add up. Um, and sometimes there are artists that don't want to do it until they have a bit more established audiences, which like I get it, but I don't get it. Like I get the from the way that they're looking at it, but it's like, mm -hmm. nah, that doesn't make sense. It's gonna be harder to do it once you're bigger because less people are gonna see you because that's just how this shit works, you know. It's weird. Exactly. Um, but I think that yeah, artists should definitely start on that the moment you start marketing and promoting yourself. Um, because like you said, like you're renting space on these platforms at any moment, like you could do something. Uh, and it's taken away. I once had a client once where my first point of contact with him was his manager reaching out because his artist, well, the artist had posted some video that got his account taken down. And he, like, he had maybe like 300,000 followers and oh, then wow. just like that, taken away. Yeah, he did gone. And it was like, that's yeah, gone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, was, uh, it, was, it was a wild day. But it's and like, that's the real... Oh, 
Uh, what were we saying? I was going to say, there's so many benefits too to like building that email list up because now you can actually yeah. create some, some revenue out of those subscribers. Then now you own the list also. But even yeah, like from, from, from my standpoint as a promoter, if you come to me, like if you're an independent artist without an agent, out of manager, but you want to come, you come to me and you want to play like my 200 cap room. And I've never heard of you before, but you say, Hey, I want to play in Orlando and I have an email list with 500 subscribers in Orlando. Um, and you know, I don't know, 20, 30% of them open my emails and, um, and another percentage buys something every time I send an email out. Um, so, you know, so show them that list um, or tell them you have that list and that's going to make it so much easier for you to even book a show. Cause me as a promoter that knows this stuff, um, when an artist comes to me to list of 500 people wanting to play a 200 cap room, it's a no brainer. Yeah, let's do it. Cause yeah, they probably know how really. to continue building that list and keep, I guess, expanding our audience for that market. Yeah. I, I never even thought that way. Like the email list does show like work ethic. It's like you did something to get those 500 emails. Like you, like you said, you do understand it. And yeah, that, that makes it, like that's so much sexier to a promoter than just saying like, yo, book me. I know I bring someone like, no, show me. How do, you, how do I know that? Like, <laughs> I'm, like, like, I'm the one putting the money up. Like prove that to me, show me the list. Yeah. Uh, and then I, I've also been trying to encourage people to get into SMS collecting, so collecting phone numbers. It is a, it is a bit more expensive um, initially because like most email providers let you use it free up to a certain amount. But mm-hmm. over time you got to pay for both. So I think if you exactly. are going to put money into it, uh, Phone numbers have, or SMS marketing has a lot higher opening rates. Typical email list opening rates are like, what, a good email list is like 20, 30%. Um, right. Whereas like a good SMS list is like 70 to 90%. Um, yeah. And then it's even like the, the lower- It's like the new email, from when email first started, like when like when internet first came around and email first came around, that was the open rate for emails. But now we get bombarded with so many emails that we don't open stuff anymore. And yeah, like you said, SMS yeah. list has much higher open rate. I can't even imagine a 50% email open, uh, well, uh, like an 80% email <laughs> open right list. But yeah, and, and it's so much more direct because like everyone has their phone in their hands at all times. Like you check okay. your text. You know what I'm even, if they, even if I don't even if I don't click it and interact with it, I see it. You know what I'm saying? I'm at least aware that you sent me a text. So I've been encouraging people to get into that. And then um, we have kind of like this other idea that we call like the poor man's email list. And it's like a Discord mm-hmm. group or any of like those community building apps kind of is it kind of goes against the whole policy because you are on a, another platform but it's like if you just really don't have the capacity to keep up with an email list or maintain an sms list then building like a community even like a facebook group or a reddit group yeah. or like i said a discord group is a good alternative because you're still pushing these people the biggest thing that you want the biggest thing that intent that the list show is intent right, right. like if someone moves to do something that person is a lot uh, a lot better of a prospect. That person is exactly. more likely to spend money on you because they took an extra step that they didn't have to take. They did some work. So like exactly. your big thing is like, you just want to see who can you push away from the platform to other stuff. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And those are people that you want to pay attention to the most. So like if you have, I don't know, like a thousand followers and you post about your group and 20 people go join your group, like you need to really pay attention to those 20 people. Like those are the 20 people that yep. like, when you have t-shirts for sale, they're going to buy a t-shirt because yep. they didn't have to go do that. You know, that way. So yeah, I think those three, minutes, definitely email and like the money's in the email list because email, you can have a different tone than you have on your socials. Like you can have a salesy tone in the email in the email uh, that you send out and your fans will be completely fine with it. Whereas like if you're super right. salesy on your Instagram, they're turned off from it. Or if you're super salesy on your TikTok, exactly. they're turned off from it. So I think it gives you a different level of power. Um, and then you're always, always try, supposed to be trying to find just different ways to have touch points with your fan bases. You know what I'm saying? So you can communicate different points or so you can remind them about the same thing from six different angles, you know? So, <laughs> and, yeah, but so. even if you get on your email list or your Facebook group, whichever it is, you still have to, I always say you have to add, continue to add value. So always like practice what, what Gary yeah. says, jab, 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 right hook, right? So yeah. offer value a few times. So, you know, like every time you offer value, that's like making a deposit into a bank account. And then whenever you throw a right hook and have a call to action, you have a big withdrawal so you also want to make sure you're in a positive balance because if you're always withdrawing, calling, having a call to action, then eventually the salesy stuff's not going to work anymore. Yeah, exactly. People don't like salesy. People like people like people like being sold to. They just don't like to know that they're being sold to. Yeah, exactly. So something <laughs> cool I um, recently heard was so let's say you get someone on your email list and then they go to the next step. Maybe they become a subscriber on Patreon or some kind of subscription service. Um, mm-hmm. Like you said, always take care of your most closest fans, I guess, first. So when ones are 
your subscribers, like maybe share content with them first. And then yeah. after a few days, then share with your email list. And then after a few days, then make it public. Um, many benefits, right? It makes, makes those people feel special because they're getting first dibs on the content. But then two, if it's like a unlisted YouTube video, now all of a sudden right out of the gate, that video has uh, some views and likes probably already, maybe even comments since those are your, you share with your most loyal fans first. Um, yeah. And that's like a great way to go publish it and go public. Yeah, exactly. And that's what you want, man. Like you want that funnel. Like you want that funnel from super, super supporters to like casual supporters. Like all of them are important for different reasons. Like your casual exactly. supporters might not buy anything, but they like your content and get it spread out. And then your super, super, super supporters, you know what I'm saying? Make sure you eat at night. So it's like you have to, <laughs> yeah. you have to, you have to treat them. You, you have to treat them all with the same respect as being a part of your fan base. But mm -hmm. people want to feel different. Like people exactly. want to know that if I do this extra action, I get something that these other people don't get. And mm -hmm. that's different for every artist. Cause like you said, some artists can get by with like first looks. I know artists that have turned their email list and or some of these things to like this full blown, like just content series that you don't get access to unless you get into this other stuff. And exactly. I think like that's like that's 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 so cool to me, you know what I'm saying? Cause it's like that's that's what all these bigger platforms are doing. It's very B2C and no one like we talked about earlier, like no one could take away a B2C relationship. It's like if I'm your fan and I can talk to you through six different platforms and you'll respond to me on one of them, I'm like, what, what do I need? I don't care if, if your your label, you know what I'm saying, doesn't like you anymore. I don't care, you know what I'm saying? Like right. I, I'm a support, <laughs> you're talking to me, like that's all I care about as a fan. Exactly. So I don't know, that that's and it's, it goes back to what you said earlier, man. Getting artists to understand that you're a business, even the process of selling your music, your events, your merch, any experiences, anything is no different than the sales funnel that we use to get clients or the sales funnel that we use to sell products or the sales funnel that like McDonald's use, uses to sell burgers. Like it's, it's all yeah. the same stuff, you know what I'm saying? Structurally, it's just the way you do it is different. Like what you put out to people and maneuver it is different. But I think the more artists that get that and understand that, I, I think that the industry will be interesting, you know what I'm saying, because of it. Because we're going to get a lot of artists who, a lot of these artists are already looking at people like Gary Vee and these, like, you know, these serial entrepreneurs. So it's like, once they get that in their minds, they're like, oh shit, I can do this with my music. It's like, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly, bro. Like, I think, that, I just think that's going to be a much more positive industry experience because of that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I also harder, like that you said, but yeah. Yeah, it's harder. It takes more time, right? But I also like that yeah. you uh, mentioned the always to take care, like even like, you know, the, the casual fans, because yeah. there, there's a reason why someone's a casual fan. Maybe it's monetary, maybe um, you never know what they're yeah. going through in their current like life cycle, but a current, um, like I guess, casual fan can become a true fan or super fan down the road. So that's why it's still yeah. always important to continue feeding them uh, some value yeah. as well. And then hopefully down yeah. the road, get them to convert. Yeah, um, yeah exactly. I could talk to you probably for, for hours <laughs> and then time's going by super quick. <laughs> let me, uh, let me ask you a couple of fun, uh, like rapid fire, quick questions. Um, right. who are some of your past and current mentors? Some of my past and current mentors. Um, so past mentor, uh, this guy by the name of Jonathan. Hey, uh, he used to be like a publicist. Now he's a producer. He's probably one of the first people to give me an industry job. I started like his intern when I was in college. And then him and a friend started a boutique record label. I was still in college and they brought me on. That was that was one of the first times that I got a lot of the information that put me like thinking about the way the industry really works. Because I talk all the time about a lot of times as music lovers, you come into the industry with like these rose tinted glasses and you think the industry works a certain way, and then you get in, you're like, oh shit, it works nothing like that. So like <laughs> I, I broke a lot of those glasses with them like that was the first time i was on the call with like our heart radio and they're like yeah it's like a hundred thousand dollars for a radio campaign like a hundred thousand dollars for a radio like what okay <laughs> so um so yeah him and i had a professor in college by the name of uh we call him professor butler but his name is like ali ryan butler he used to work for atlantic records um now he works for the dc chapter of the grammy association and like, he's been one of my earliest he's one of the earliest people that i knew because i'm from I'm from, uh, from a very small town so like he was one of the first people I met that like worked in the music industry. You know what I'm saying, and he put me in a lot of game. And then, I mean, he's still both of them are still current mentors. There's still two people that I talk to a lot today. And then, I mean, thankfully, man, because of the nature of what we do, as far as like putting out content and being in the education space, I would argue that just all of the other like content personalities that have conversations with me, you know, what I'm saying, because of stuff like that, mm -hmm. are are mentors. Because, like I said, because of what we do. I get answers to questions and people are so open to give me information because I put information right. out. And yeah, I, I've, learned a, 
Yeah, exactly. Like, I've learned a lot from just random people that follow me, reaching out, teaching me stuff. And sometimes even like artists that follow me, that like me, they'll hit me and be like, yo, man, I was testing this out and this happened. I'm like, oh shit, I've never seen it before. Like you just taught me something. You know, like, I, I've never <laughs> had that happen before. Like, thank you. Um, yeah. So I would even argue like that, but yeah, those who definitely, man. And my business partner started out as kind of like a mentor, but and we're more like, you know, uh, I, I guess your business partner can be a mentor, man. I still tell him that. Yeah, I still tell him that. I still tell him that. It makes my uh, my heart warm that you uh, gave a shout out to your to your professor as a fellow professor. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, no, man. Like, like I said, he was one of the first people that just just put me on game about the industry. And like, I, I, it, there are a few people that um because the industry door man is such a tight door like people just do not want to let you through that door right. and i am just am always thankful that they were people that at least let me peek through their state because everyone's industry door is different like no one has the same industry door everyone is, but the fact that i at least got to peek into an industry door was enough for me because i think that uh you know seeing that something is possible completely changes the mindset about it and like i said coming from a small town where i've never met anyone in the music industry it's easy to think that like, oh, that'll never happen but then when you're getting introduced to people or meeting people or hearing conversations about people that like they do this every single day this is their job they're regular people that starts made me go like oh shit like this is, this is okay like, i can get in here i don't know how i'm gonna get in here but i can get in here so yeah man so yeah yeah started with that man started with a professor <laughs> what was the first yeah. concert you ever been to the first concert I ever went to was my homecoming concert, my freshman year of college. Uh, it was 2011. So who was performing? This was when Kendra Lamar was first. Kendra Lamar performed. Oh, wow. Meek Mill. Awesome. Uh, what was it? Kendra Lamar, Meek Mill. This group that was hot at the time called Travis Porter and then Miguel. Um, at the time, what was interesting was the set list was Miguel was the headliner and then Travis Porter was the co-headliner. And then Meek was like the opening act. And then Kendrick was like, wow. like, yeah, like the little, like there was a lot of time. The first people, there was a lot of people's first time ever hearing about Kendrick. Like he was known the West coast then, but this is before he broke and became like mainstream. So, and that mm -hmm. concert was maybe a good six months before his first like mainstream hit just really put him out there. So yeah. That's pretty that, cool. I, yeah. yeah that was, that, looking back on it, it was dope. Like that was, Seeing him in Meek Mill, especially from where they were then to like now, it's like, oh man, like I watched that. I watched them grow, grow out of that. The baby phase. I love it. It's so cool. Yeah, um, yeah. What What are the the books, documentaries, or podcasts that you recommend the most? Uh, books I would recommend the most. Uh, well, okay. So as far as podcasts, uh, really big on Creative Juice. Sargas podcast is really dope. Mm -hmm. um, I listen to this one podcast a lot called Earn Your Leisure and it's not music industry based it's more so just about like general entrepreneurship and they talk to people that have done entrepreneurial things in the music industry but it's more so just about like other industry stuff because um, mm -hmm. like I said I'm really big on there are things that we in music can learn from other industries so it's like we need to pay Absolutely. attention pay attention to other industries so that one definitely uh, I'm really big on the Joe Budden podcast once again <laughs> just because he throws in like he has some episodes that have like some real industry talks in there it's like damn nobody else is talking about this type of stuff um this way uh as far as books of course gotta give it to everything you need to know about the music business like the, the bible yep <laughs> um never split the difference i can't think of the name of the author but never split the difference is, is this book about negotiation from the point of view of an ex-cia uh like terrorist negotiator and i think that's a really dope book because awesome. everything about the music industry is negotiation based. So like, you <laughs> need to have a good grasp of at least like, at least the art of, it's so many things I learned from that book that I haven't seen work for me. So I just recommend that book to everybody. I don't know, what else? Um, what is that? What's this book? <laughs> oh, it is All Marketers Tell, Tell Lies by Seth Golden. Oh, Seth, Seth Golden is awesome. Yeah, Seth Golden's one of the GOAT marketers. All of his books. I think it's dope. Um, the other one, the purple elephant is really dope, but personally I like all marketers tell lies the best because the way he breaks down in that. And of course, like the Gary Vee stuff, job, job, right hook, crushing it, really mm -hmm. good books. And then I, I also am big on staying on top of like biographies. Mm -hmm. So like Jay Prince's biography, who's the founder of rap -A records out of Houston, uh, or even down to like 50 cents, just like people in our space that have done something because everything repeats itself, you know what I'm saying? Everything right. that happened in the music cool. industry today was happening then. It just was, technology was different, the landscape was different, but the, yep. the characteristics of it were the same. So like, I try to like, 
look for the red flags that people publish in their memoirs and stuff yeah. like that. Very cool. <laughs> what is the most common bad advice you hear given in our industry? The most common bad advice? Um, hmm, the most common bad advice. I think, I don't know if it's, I don't, I don't have a, a piece of advice that I can pinpoint on. I think the most toxic thing that goes on in, in the industry is the perception that the artist does it all or the artist is kind of handling everything on their own. I, I hate watching interviews of artists and they'll be like, yo, you know what I'm saying? Like, how did you get here? And it's like, oh, you know, I just kind of like did my thing. And, you know, here we are. It's like, no, you didn't. Like, you had a team of yeah. 10 people doing things for you around the clock for the last eight months. Right. And oh, oh I, I think it's just toxic with the whole perception of um, making it seem like they do it themselves and it all happens so fast. So, yeah. but I do see, thankfully, a lot more people are getting vocal about that. It's not it's such a big thing, but advice, I don't know. I think, hmm, yeah, that's a hard one. I've never thought about it. Before. I've never <laughs> thought about like the worst piece of advice I've heard. Well, well I, um, so I'm, I'll ask you the, the opposite question. What's the best advice you've ever, you've ever gotten? But before I ask that, um, I, I like that point that you made, right? Because, and not saying that Chance the Rapper is the kind of artist that doesn't give anyone else credit, but to the to like the public, like to the average person, it seems like there is no team mind, and he's like truly independent. And I'm yeah. always like, he has one of the biggest agencies in the world booking shows for him and getting yeah. him on festivals. Like, yeah, as a as music is truly independent. It's not on a label. Yeah. But outside of that, he has a massive, massive machine that that is moving that and that whole engine forward. Um yeah. that you made, made that point. Uh, yeah. but yeah, what's, what's, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was gonna say, and it's completely toxic to the idea of like artists need to think of their their music like a company. Because like no business does like I would lose my mind if I had to do everything by myself. Like it wouldn't happen. <laughs> Yeah, you know? <laughs> and it's like so you, much. you would too, you know. Like you need people, um, and but, you gotta be able to focus on your music because you're doing everything. Then like, like, like we met, talked about throughout this this podcast, like it's good to know about these things so you can you're hiring the right people. But at the end of the day, you're the artist. You have to create art, and if you're more spending more time on business and not creating art, then that eventually your business is gonna suffer because you're not creating the whole like foundation of your business. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I agree with that. What's what's the, the best advice you've ever gotten? Uh, the best advice I've ever gotten. The best advice I think I've ever gotten was when I first <laughs> when I first uh, started my business. Um, my mentor, one of my mentors, told me what did he say? He was like, uh, "It's always the people that spend the least amount of money that are the most amount of work," and that has been the truest thing I've ever like heard in my life. Because mm -hmm. at the time I didn't get it, I was like, "What do you mean by that?" He's like, "You'll get it, bro." Like, because like, he started out as a publicist, so I think that a publicist journey in the mid two thousands, early two thousand is the same as the digital marketers today. They kind of navigate the same space. So he's like, "Yeah, but like I started there too, like with the getting local clients and then building up." He's like, "So he's like, it's always the people that spend the least amount of money that are the most amount of work," and that's yeah. been. <laughs> Like the, I, and the biggest thing I got of it is anytime I've ever gotten a client or gotten something, I thought like, oh, this is about to be like an easy campaign. It's always turned into the most well-deserved, well-earned, like overworked, <laughs> like yeah. overworked for a campaign. So I know that. And then uh, also the advice of my other mentor, my professor actually gave me was um, like the, he just kind of put me in the whole concept of like failing for it. He was the one that kind of had me thinking that it's okay to try stuff and not like it because the more things that you know you don't like, the closer you are to figuring out what it is that you like. Like, I didn't I, I didn't start out ever thinking I would be doing music marketing. Like, I just yeah. kind of got thrown into this, you know what I'm saying, just through a series of life choices that led, <laughs> that led me here. But like, yeah. I like it. You know what I'm I like doing it. And that came from me trying stuff, going, uh, I don't really like this side of that industry. Let me try some other stuff. Okay. So probably those two things, man, like, because I, I think that the person that, is comfortable with like trying stuff and failing like they learn a lot faster because mm -hmm. like you know you learn a lot from people's successes but you learn a lot more from like your own mistakes you know if you're like self-aware enough to like pick out why you messed up or what went wrong about it you'll learn a lot more from that type of stuff yeah that, that resonates with me so much because i've changed my major like literally probably 10 or 11 times in college and yeah. i had so many different jobs in so many different industries. Uh, I think the longest I've ever been in the industry before the music industry was like three or four years. And then now in the music industry, I'm, I'm stuck. <laughs> I've been yeah. <laughs> um, uh, that, before I ask you the last question that I, that I ask everyone, uh, I just want to thank you so much for, for your time, um, for 
really, you know, thank you, man. Yeah. For, for, I think for explaining things and, um, I feel like there's so many good lessons and uh, things that people can learn from this, but also all the content that you guys do, like you share such awesome content and it's just like a breath of fresh air seeing people like you guys um, and you know, and Circa and all the other people that are creating good content or, and it's coming from a good place to like actually want to help artists. So just thanks for, for what you guys do and put, put out into our industry. Yeah, man. Appreciate it, man. I thank you for bringing me on, man. I love like having these conversations with other people who are like in it, you know what I'm saying? I like chopping it up like this. Yeah, well, hopefully uh, this, this COVID-19 stuff is over soon. And then come to Atlanta, we can just hang and uh, chop it up for, for a while. <laughs> man, fingers about. crossed, man. Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. So the question I ask everyone at the end is, what's your definition of making it? What's my definition of making it? Hmm. I think my definition of making it is being able to do whatever it is that I want to do in the moment comfortably, like without really worrying. Um, and I'm real big on like legacy. So I, you know, it's just, there are certain things that I want to leave to people that come after me that I wasn't like left and I want to be the person that changes that, you know? So I think success to me is, yeah, being able to build out my own thing and do my own thing and then come out of the situation with enough resources to help people that come after me. If I can do those two things, man, like we said, we straight, I'm good. <laughs> I love it. That's awesome. I'll end the podcast here. Um, hey, thanks so much. It was awesome getting getting to know you and talking with you. No, thank um, you, man. Yeah, we should, and we'd love to you know anytime if you want to like just catch up and and just hang. Uh, love to, to talk more. Uh, anything I can help with? Uh, if you guys want to start promoting more shows and stuff, I have a couple of videos. If you're interested, in, I can send you um, that are from from my courses. Um, <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just send you the links, and it's literally like, and I'll send you um my so the videos are basically how. The different, the different types of deals, uh, how they work, how to settle them, um, how to budget, like how to create a forecast for a show. And then okay. uh, I can send you the sheets too. So there's uh, sheets where you can do, do like your forecast, figuring out like how much we could make or lose on a show. Uh, and then and there's an offer sheet there too. So you can put together an offer that uh, once you have to start dealing with these, these stupid agents, <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. send them like an official offer. Oh yeah, please, man. Thank you. I, actually, I have a question I want to ask you just before we hop off. So yeah. So, how do how do with the with the rising popularity of online courses mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying and just like because we're in the course space so like we kind of see it from like we get a lot of our people who are just like students that want to learn it but they didn't want to go to school and they come check out our course right. but like where do you see i guess especially in the entertainment space like the the future of like um like entertainment teaching professionals going with the, the course kind of networks taking over. Like uh, the, the, the professors, do y'all, the teachers feel threatened by it or do y'all see it as just like another avenue that you'll probably hop into? Well, the interesting for, thing for me is I'm kind of in both, right? I have a, okay. I have like my own academy that I just launched. Like it's only a month old. Um, okay. And I, I teach a class at like one class. I'm not a full-time professor because I'm still okay, in okay. the industry. Um, so my honest answer, I feel like, those courses uh, are the better route to go for most artists, like the ones that are willing to put in the work. Um, yeah. But other than that, I feel like college is good to like learn other areas of the industry as long as it's a good school. Um, yeah. I've, I've been at bad schools where you really don't learn that much about the business. You learn more about the history of the business. Um, yeah. Where in my class, I, I never teach history. I'm like, I'll point you in the direction. If you learn the history, that's where it is. But yeah, everything we're going to learn, you're going to be able to apply it the second you walk out of this classroom. Um, that's how I like teaching, um, which is why I feel like I have the, the course space is more my thing. But what I, I'm doing differently is um, since I do like life teaching, um, I didn't create a course. I'm just have like a, so the Academy does it two monthly live lessons. So you just come and um, join the live lesson or, and you can ask questions and engage during the lessons. So like, it's like going to class. And then the archive okay. is always available so people can access the archive of it. Um, cause like felt, cause the, the, the course that I would have probably most likely created as a touring course and imagine I would have launched my business with a touring course, um, right now in COVID-19, like I probably would sell barely any courses cause yeah. nobody can do it right now. <laughs> it's completely irrelevant. Um, so with doing it this way, I can make my lessons like more relevant cause I can change it. Like if we're going to, we're supposed to talk about touring next month, but this happened in the industry or, TikTok's yeah. exploding. Now we're going to have a lesson about TikTok instead. Um, okay. So love that flexibility. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's dope. Okay. I was just wondering that. I was, I was thinking about that like a couple of days ago. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, I, what I'd love to see, um, and that's something I, I got my eye my on, is 
there's like more and more of these like companies popping up that are like offering a course and it's like one mm-hmm. figuring out who's who's legit and who's not but and there's yeah. other people that have like specific niches like um there's this one artist i had that is teaches strictly facebook live uh and how she's made seventy five thousand dollars in a year from facebook live um there's another artist that teaches strictly email marketing and how she's made yeah. i think she made like 50 grand just off of thousand subscribers on her email list um so what i le- love to see is some of these people almost like eventually consolidating and creating i guess bigger brands um where they're i guess sharing their strengths together um mm. that's when i got got my eye on um i'm always looking at companies like you guys or circa and i'm like who can i can i join one day down the road when i have enough to to bring to the table <laughs> okay okay no, yeah no, that's fine that's that's kind of how we've been working on building ours out is like bringing in people who because we have like one course in ours from um we have a friend that does merchandising for love renaissance and he mm-hmm. came in did like a merchandising course for our network and then took one of our network members and like walked her through the process from manufacturing to like selling it and like she's implementing that into her merch strategy it, uh, like it's that was, it's so cool to see that but yeah yeah man like, like we're i know we're definitely open to stuff like this so that may be a conversation we could have at some point but um, especially with um especially with like that because the touring booking aspect of it it's hard to find really specific information on it yeah uh, really hard yeah. oh. <laughs> and, and, and it's one of the things my buddy uh jovan that i want to introduce you to uh yeah. told me about it's like it's almost like the uh the dirty secret of the industry like nobody yeah. wants to say how this works because it's like a very exclusive club um so yeah. you know right now i'm kind of doing it mostly privately through my academy um not if, but when I uh, go completely independent and leave the, the big corporation, uh, I will put a lot more content out publicly. Um, I, like I've put a public like how to settle deals, um, so the five main deal types and how to settle them. Mm-hmm. But there's a lot of stuff that I could share like where, for people that want to become promoters. And I feel like there's an audience for that too. Uh, so yeah, I'm very definitely. close to being to that point. Um, kind of being like you when you were in 2018 when you ripped the band-aid off and you, you quit your job. I saw that in your first blog post. Oh yeah, yeah. I appreciate it, man. Oh yeah, you saw that. Oh yeah, that's fire, bro. Yeah, yeah. I said I do my research. <laughs> that's wild, bro. Nobody's ever brought that up. I like I I wrote that and was like, man, I hope no. I didn't like when I wrote that. I never intended of being like because the YouTube stuff came way after that, so I didn't intend to be like an influencer. So I, I'm always shocked that like when people bring it up. I'm like, damn, bro, you ain't read that. That's crazy. Yeah, that was actually my first question, but because we dove right into it, I was like, ah, I'm just. Not gonna go that far backwards now. We're yeah, already yeah, in it. <laughs> <laughs> but cool, yeah, I'll send you that stuff. Um, and I'll uh, if you, if you're interested, I'll introduce you to Jovan, or I can send you some info about his company first, so you can check it out. And then if you if you're interested, I can send an intro between two you guys. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, uh, let's do it. Cool. And I'll send you a reminder. Also, send me a photo as the episode cover. Um, right. And this will come out in about a month. Um, I have a few like I'm pre- I pre-record um, podcast episodes. Um, okay. So I have like always a batch to fall back on when I'm back on the road. Okay. All right, cool. Yeah, I got you. I'll send it to you. Um, let me find one. I'll send you one by the end of the day. Sounds good. Cool. Awesome, man. It was nice talking to you and uh, hope you can keep in touch and talk some more. Yeah, same, man. Stay safe and stay, stay healthy, man. All right, same to you. Take care. Have a good day. You too. Peace.